Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm a third year PhD student in math. And I'm very excited to talk to you today about universality. So universality is a concept in math, and in particular, random matrix theory, where things which don't seem to be related in any way behave the same once you scale them appropriately. And this may not make any sense right now, which is fine. Um, hopefully it becomes clear over the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So just a quick, quick show of hands. Has anyone taken a course in probability or statistics before? One, oh, a lot of people, good. Good, you've done your background reading, that's great. Um, so what, what I'll be doing in the first part is just restating the central limit theorem and explaining it for people who have never seen it before. And then the next part of the talk, I will talk about random matrix theory. So if you know what matrices are, it's probably not too hard to guess what a random matrix is. And then towards the end of my talk, I'll give two examples, one from within math and one from outside of math, where universality also seems to play a role. So the, f yeah, the, re the reason I put this one up is, one, because I, I think it's a pretty funny picture. But two, I, I want to keep this very informal. So if you have questions, just shout them out. Um, I also have three questions in the slides. So if you get it right, you can meet me after. You get a prize. So I want to keep it kind of interactive. So yeah, so let's begin with the central limit theorem. So an easy way to understand the central limit theorem is by thinking about flipping a coin, right? So let's say we flip a coin 15 times. Um, there's two important things about this. The first is that the tosses are independent. This means that the val like if you get a heads on the first flip, it doesn't affect what you get on the rest of the flips, right? The second is that the tosses are identically distributed. This means that the probability of the first coin coming up heads is the same as the second coin coming up heads on and on and on. So we can study this by looking at random variables. So xi is a random variable. It's a 1 if the ith toss is a head, 0 if it's a tails. So the first question I have for you guys, just raise your hand. What is the expected value of xi? Anybody? Come on. Somebody, somebody's got to know it. Oh, so it's 50% 50, 50 for heads, 50% for tails, a fair coin. Yeah, yeah. so exactly one half, right? So you get, you get a prize. Um, the, next, uh, the next thing you can look at is the variance. So variance controls how much you differ from the mean. So if xi is very far away from its expected value, you'll have a lot of variance. If it's very close to its mean, you won't have a lot of variance, right? So it controls how how spread out you are. And now let's say we want to study this for n getting very big, right? So we can set Sn to be x1 plus x2 all the way up to xn. And if you think about it, this is just counting the number of heads you get, right? So you get a 1 if your heads, 0 if your tails. So when you add them all up, you're counting the number of heads that you get, right? So is everyone, any questions on that so far? No? All right. So what do you think happens when you take the number of heads, divide by the total number of trials, and send this number of trials to infinity? What is the ratio of number of heads that you think you would get? This is another question for the audience. Your expectation value? Yeah, which is? 50%. Right, so you get one half again, right? And you can do some more interesting things, right? So you can take this quantity Sn, the number of heads that you want to see, you can subtract off n over 2, right, which is exactly how many heads you expect to get. So you take Sn and you center it, and then you scale it by this root n over 4. And also, really important, you're centering it and then you're scaling it, right? And you want to say, what is the probability that this new centered and rescaled variable is less than some number x? And this is just phi of x. So you may be familiar with this phi of x. It's what's called the CDF of the normal distribution, right? So phi of 3 is basically 1. And this means that the probability that a standard normal is less than 3 is pretty much 1, right? You can see here the yellow line is basically 0. So it's very unlikely 
that you get something less than minus 3. So most of the distribution is between minus 3 and 3. And so the last question for the audience, if x is normal 0, 1, which is this blue bell curve here, what is the expected value of x plus 1 half? Exactly, it's 1 half. So you may have noticed that all of the answers were 1 half. This one was a bit forced because the expected value of x is actually 0. But then when you add a half, you get a half. Because 0 plus 1 half is 1 half. So that is uh, the normal distribution. And actually, it's a very important distribution in statistics for a number of reasons. But one of them is because of the central limit theorem. right? So we take now any other sequence of random variables that you want. right? So they could have mean 5 billion. They could have mean 0. They could have any variance you want as long as it's finite. And as long as they're independent and identically distributed, meaning they're distributed the same, right? we can say that the average number of occurrences is going to be exactly the mean. right? This is the law of large numbers. We can also do the same thing that we did before. We can center it so we can take our Sn, subtract off n times the mean, right, and scale it. And we get the exact same 5x that we had on the previous slide. So this is important for a number of reasons. The first reason this is important is because you can have very different global behavior. right? If the mean of this is, say, 100, and you do this and you add 10 of them, you'll get a thousand on, on average, right? as opposed to our coin flips, which have probability one half. So they can be very different in how they behave. But if you center them and scale them appropriately, they all behave exactly the same. So this is the first kind of toy model of universality. Because if you have independent random variables, you scale them the right way, they're all like the normal. So we're going to go to random matrix theory next, which is trying to make this kind of like a central limit theorem for a very specific case of non-independent random variables. So before we go there, does anyone have questions on the first bit? No? All right, great. Um, so a matrix is just a collection of numbers. So we have an n by n matrix here. So you have n rows, n columns. In each entry, you just stick a number in there. Right? A vector would be n rows in one column, and you just stick a number in there as well. And is anyone unfamiliar with the concept of uh, eigenvalue or eigenvector? OK, no, that's great. So this is the equation for, to, to tell you if you have an eigenvalue eigenvector pair. And you can think that if you have an eigenvector v, and you hit it with a, right? That's the left side of the equation. The right side of the equation is saying you take v and you stretch it by a number lambda. So studying eigenvalues and eigenvectors of matrices are important because they can tell you how the matrix kind of distorts space in the direction of your eigenvectors. And if that doesn't make sense, that's completely fine. Just remember that matrices have eigenvalues. And to study matrices, we want to study their eigenvalues. Okay. So a little bit more terminology. Uh, we say matrix is symmetric if Aij equals Aji. That means this 2, 1 entry is the same as this 1, 2 entry. This n2 entry is the same as this 2n entry. It's symmetric because you can take it, you can flip it over the diagonal, and it's still going to be the same. right? And these are nice because they all have real eigenvalues. So if you have an n by n matrix, right, n rows, n columns, and it's symmetric, it'll also have n real eigenvalues. So now that we know what matrices are, let's talk a little bit about random matrices. So if you went up to somebody and said, give me a random 3 by 3 matrix, they'd probably just put a random number in each entry. Right? That's the most sensible thing to do. So what I did here is I put a random standard normal in each entry, right? the same one that we saw a few slides ago. And this matrix has eigenvalues, but as you can see, I've just computed them. It has two complex eigenvalues. So what you can do, you can make A symmetric by taking it, flipping it around, and adding it back to itself. And then you'll get this matrix. right? And you can see now that this matrix is symmetric. So this is the exact same as this. 
that's the same as that, that's the same as that. So if you flip it along its diagonal, you actually get the same matrix back. And as promised before, you have a symmetric matrix, you have three real eigenvalues. So what you can do is you can say, okay, now generate nine new numbers, make it symmetric, you get three new eigenvalues, right? So we want to study maybe statistical properties of these new eigenvalues. So realize this might be a little bit tough to see, but in blue, I took a 500 by 500 random matrix constructed exactly as before and plotted its eigenvalues. And you can see it's kind of sparse towards the edges and really nice and uniformly spread out through here. In yellow, I took just a random number in this range. So you can see there are some gaps. It doesn't care whether you're at the edges because they're all independent. It do they don't know where the other random numbers I picked were. Right? But for the case of eigenvalues of a random matrix, you can actually show, and I hope that this picture illustrates, that they actually are very sensitive to the location of other eigenvalues. So they tend to spread out. They don't want to be too close. Right? And they try to maximize pairwise distance between each other. So what you can do is you can take the largest eigenvalue of one of these matrices that I saw, told you before, and you can prove that it, its expected value is root 2n, where n is the size of your matrix. And even though they're not independent, you can show that the quantity of interest, your largest eigenvalue, the one furthest to the right, you subtract off the expected value, you scale, you're not scaling by root n anymore, you're scaling by a different value, but you scale appropriately, the probability that this is less than x is something else. It's called the tracy Widom distribution. Just like the normal, it's just a different distribution. And the really kind of incredible thing about universality is it doesn't matter what we put inside the random matrix to start off with. So we could put any other random, random entries inside this random matrix, make it symmetric and look at its eigenvalues, scaled appropriately. So it might not be root 2n anymore. It could be really far to the right. It could be you know, just like the mean in the central limit theorem didn't have to be the same. But when you subtract its mean and scale it, they all behave like Tracy Widom. Um, so this is what universality is in random matrix theory. And so now I'm going to get to two examples. The first comes from pure math. And this problem started probably in the 1930s and was only solved in about 1999. Um, but I like this problem because I think it's fairly easy to understand. So you take the numbers 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n, and you look at a random permutation of this set of numbers. What this means is you can just flip-flop any of the numbers and just get a new set of six numbers in a different order, maybe the same order. So for instance, this is one random permutation, right? 1, 3, 6, 4, 5, 2. And then I, I want to say, what is the properties of the longest increasing subsequence? So the definition of this is tough to write out, but it's easy to s tell kind of intuitively, right? So 1, 3, 4, 5 is an increasing sequence, right? Um, hopefully we all know that 3 is bigger than 1, and 4 is bigger than 3, and 5 is bigger than 4, right? So, and it, it has length 4. So, you can look through this and you can say, well, no other sequence has length uh, four, right? Here, this is a different random sequence and it's got two subsequences of length two, but it has no subsequences of greater length than two. So you can go four, five, but you, you can't go one more. You have two, three, but you can't go one more. So we want to say, again, we play the same game, we send n to infinity, and we want to say, can we talk about the, the distribution of this longest in increasing subsequence. And again, you can show that for pi is just a permutation, right? Subtract the mean, which you can show is 2 root n, which took maybe about 40 years to just prove that this was the mean. Scale it appropriately. It behaves like a different Tracy Widom. So on the face of it, just this has nothing to do with random matrices, but it's it was proved using all of these techniques from random matrix theory that people didn't really think to look at before. And the last uh, one I think is pretty interesting, uh, and it deals with public transport in Cuernavaca, which is a city in Mexico. And uh, 
It's actually known for being the most dangerous city in Mexico, but mathematicians know it for a different reason, and that's because of its public transport system. And unlike most cities, the, the people who drive the buses don't work for the government or they don't work for a single company. They instead all work for themselves, which means that when they're driving around picking people up, they want to maximize the number of people that get on their bus so they maximize the amount of money that they're paid. And so you can think about it from their perspective. They don't want to arrive too soon after the last bus left, otherwise no one will get on the bus. They don't want to be too late, otherwise another bus will come in and, and take the people that they want to have, right? And so they try to spread themselves really nicely within like, the time slots and the routes. And all they, all they know is that maybe when they pull up to one spot, they may have a friend there, or they may ask you know, the person at the shop, or they may ask someone in line, like, how long have you been waiting? And this is all the information they have. And then there is a, I forget actually what field of, of science this was, but they, they studied the distribution of, of these wait times that they had, and they showed they behaved exactly like eigenvalues of a random matrix, which makes sense when you think about that they want to spread out as much as they can. Um, well, yeah, so that is my talk. And if there are any questions, um, feel free to ask.